So I'm going to talk about uh, three things today, and I'll uh, begin uh, with a few less numbers than the minister uh, on, the, on the forecast for the next five years. So the value of uh, Australian agricultural production has been increasing steadily. It's up by about 10% over the last five years, uh, with uh, variation across uh, the different major groups. So um, livestock prices have been quite favourable uh, for the last little while, while, while crops have, uh, have had a, a, a tough time with low prices because of uh, high levels of global supply. Um, we're projecting... <coughs> Uh, continued growth, a return to seasonal conditions, so it comes off the off the boil uh, uh, a little, um, <clears throat> but you can see that uh, livestock and crops are both doing well, and that horticulture uh, is doing very well off a, off a low base. When we look out to exports, <clears throat> exports have been, been growing well. Um, they're, they're up 12%, so they've been growing faster than uh, agriculture uh, as a, as a whole, and that's up by about um, five billion over the last five years. So that export growth accounts for 90% uh, of the growth in value of the sector as a whole uh, over the last five years. You can see crops are, uh, are not doing as well and, and that horticulture has had a, uh, had a very good uh, run. <clears throat> now, when you look at the specific commodities, essentially uh, across the board, it's, it's doing well. Uh, the exceptions are sugar, which is down a little in our forecast uh, over the next two years, and that livestock and uh, wine are, are pretty stable. But when you add that up, <clears throat> with the return to average uh, seasonal conditions and yields, it's a growth of about um, 5%. Sorry. Uh, yeah, about 5% uh, over the next five years. That's uh, adding a, a further $2.4 billion. Um, <clears throat> it, it continues to be underpinned by strong demand for, for livestock. Horticulture is doing well and will be boosted by uh, a number of plantings that have been established uh, in recent years coming in to, to start to, to deliver fruit and nuts. Uh, and we're expecting some improvement in productivity in cropping uh, with return to seasonal uh, conditions over the trend. So there's three big assumptions that underpin our forecast. We, we like to be clear so people can, can uh, use them intelligently. Uh, the, the first one I've mentioned is the uh, assumption about average seasonal conditions and, and yields. Uh, the next two uh, are economic growth uh, and the exchange rate. So economic growth has picked up in the last year or so. Uh, we expect it uh, to remain strong. We're not unusual in that expectation, but broad-based growth across the advanced economies and the emerging markets, uh, with, with some uh, return to, to potential trend for, further in. That's driven uh, largely by the emerging economies. That's been true for more than a decade, so it's not a very brave assumption to make. Uh, China we see coming off the, uh, uh, off the boil a bit and returning to a more robust uh, and sustainable, in our view, uh, uh, rate of growth as, as the Chinese economy uh, rebalances. There's other, uh, other assumptions, but the, the exchange rate is the main one. So we assume the exchange rate will weaken, coming down from uh, a point, uh, uh, sorry, 78 cents, where it is at, at the moment, uh, down to, to US uh, 74 for most of the forecast period. Uh, but I'll highlight that the forecasts are particularly sensitive to exchange rates. So, so obviously any uh, even small changes in exchange rates uh, can make a big difference uh, to, to the value of exports. And the second topic that I'd like to talk about is to preview a product that we'll be putting out uh, in the next four weeks or so called Snapshot of Australian Agriculture. Uh, Maybe we're dull, um, but you know the snapshot of Australian agriculture presents a snapshot of Australian agriculture. So, so there'll be sort of three big. Um, it'll be pretty short. There'll be three uh, short, punchy, juicy uh, sections of that. We'll be talking about contributions. Uh, we'll be talking about context, and I'll be talking about the composition of the industry. So, contributions of agriculture. Uh, everybody in this room probably knows quite well. Uh, agriculture uses a lot of water and land as a share of, of what's available in Australia. Uh, so, up around 50%. Varies a little. Um, 
uh, punches above its weight in exports, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but in the sort of 14 to 16% of exports uh, is not unusual. Rural employment um, <coughs> is reasonably high, and then national employment and gross domestic product in the 2 to 3% range. When you talk about exports, around three quarters of Australian agricultural product is exported. Uh, much of that uh, as uh, raw commodities, uh, as bulk commodities, um, but a smaller section goes into high value added or, or um, transformed product. Uh, and it's just important to keep that supply chain story in mind. So, so when you look at that substantially transformed um, area, it's worth almost twice as much uh, as the raw commodity exports. Uh, and that's where a lot of the uh, additional uh, uh, employment and labour, which wasn't on the previous slide, uh, comes into play. That's where a lot of the uh, contribution to regional communities comes through. Uh, and it's, of course, where a lot of the dollars flow. <coughs> Context of Australian agriculture, I'll be pretty brief because I'll come back to this. Uh, so everybody knows that Australian farmers uh, are effective and, and they're managing the most variable climate in the world. Uh, it can be a bit of an eye-opener to, to dig into the detail of that and, and realise how different it is. Uh, uh, I won't go into a long digression here, but uh, last year I was at an OECD um, session where we are talking about risk management policy um, it, 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 across the OECD uh, and the things some of the other countries were saying I just found staggering uh, you know, when they think uh, government should step in and help farmers uh, manage uh, was um, uh, unusual from an Australian perspective. Uh, <clears throat> so, so Australia manages that variability effectively and it does so uh, without a lot of um, uh, government support. So composition, um, rather than talk here about uh, different uh, commodity shares, how much beef, how much lamb, how much wheat, uh, how many chickpeas, um, I'm just going to point out the sort of uh, uh, this notion that, that a small share of farmers uh, account for a very large share uh, of farm income and farm revenue. So this, this chart in particular is, is gross receipts, so it's the value of farm output. The top 10% of livestock um, uh, farms uh, account for almost half of total output. Uh, it's a very similar uh, story in cropping. Top 10% account for about 40%, and in both sectors, the top 40% of farms account for about 80% of outcomes, uh, sorry, 80% of revenue. So this is just a reminder that when we're thinking about uh, 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 supply chains, when we're thinking about uh, industry policy settings, when we're thinking about investing in infrastructure, we need to remember that farms aren't all the same and we need to make sure that uh, we're delivering for all the farms and all types of farmers uh, that, that they can get on and do the job uh, and achieve their, their goals. And then the last um, chunk of the talk uh, is talking about five key challenges. Each of these challenges offers threats and opportunities. So, so more than one threat, more than one opportunity. Um, we've drawn together, identified these challenges from a variety of sources, from engaging with stakeholders, from, from looking at ABARE's very impressive uh, back catalogue of, uh, of work, um, uh, from, from reviewing the literature and, uh, and those sorts of things. Um, but they're really big. They're not going to go away, uh, and we're not quite sure how they're going to play out. So for me, uh, this is central to the theme uh, of our, of our two-day conference here about creating value in an increasingly connected world. Uh, we know the status quo will not remain. We know things will change, and we're not necessarily quite sure how they're going to change. So let me run through these in a little bit more detail. The first is the re-emergence of Asia. So <clears throat> India and China have been global powers in the past, they're currently very important and they're going to get more significant. So the chart here, and sorry, this is probably my most geeky chart and moment, uh, the chart shows GDP per capita. It's a pretty good um, uh, proxy for average income uh, <coughs> by population. Uh, so if you are better at maths than Nicola, um, you realise the error of the chart is the value of global GDP. Um, but it's really about the distribution. What it, tells us is that 
today about a billion people live in countries which are high income countries. All right, and they're well above that line. The dotted line is the, is the World Bank's high income threshold, not the poverty line. Um, but by the time you roll out 35 years to 2050, um, it's tripled. Okay, so on these numbers, 3.8 billion, um, those numbers, of course, underpinned by a bo bunch of assumptions, but at least 3 billion people are going to be living in high income countries. Okay, and it's driven by Asia. So Asia, and in particular China, is the big dark block in the middle there. It's double the high income line. It's not just above, it's well above that high income line. Um, <clears throat> And the other little green ones are the other emerging economies. But you can see there's a lot of other Asia in the tail that's going to get there as well. And in those Asian countries in the tail in 2050, there will already be high income consumers. It's just the country as a whole hasn't sort of made that transition. So that, the re-emergence of Asia, will change things. It will change economics. Uh, it will change culture. It will change global geopolitics. Um, and it weaves in. Uh, to, the, to the rest of the challenges, the threats and opportunities we're facing. So the minister, when he was talking, talked about competitiveness and, and as a race. I hadn't sent in my slides, but it was a good introduction. So competitiveness is how we're maintaining our productivity relative to everyone else. And the first bit of context that I wanted to highlight is that we're pretty well aware uh, that other advanced countries aren't as virtuous as Australia uh, in, in levels of producer support. So this is data from the OECD. It shows that the OECD average for producer support uh, ha has decreased um, by about a sixth, 14%, um, over the last while. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Reductions in trade support, uh, trade distorting producer support uh, have come down a little bit further. What, what we haven't necessarily got our eye on the ball uh, about is that key emerging markets, China and India come particularly to mind here, uh, have been increasing their levels of producer assistance. So we don't have good data on India at the moment, but China uh, is solid. So China, over the same period, has increased uh, its assistance by 15%, while well, Australia's been doing a good job reducing ours by 4% from already very low levels. Um, and so uh, it's no good being really productive if you can't get access to markets. And so this is a real watch point um, to, to keep an eye on. The next aspect of, of competitiveness is the productivity story. So this is uh, productivity indexes. It shows you performance relative to the base period back in the, in the mid-90s. Um, we could have drawn a lot more lines on the chart, but I like keeping things simple. So essentially you've got uh, the US and New Zealand as the upper and lower bound of, of the sort of the advanced economy group. Uh, China and the EU are in the middle there, though we don't show it. Essentially those lines in the lower part of the chart are telling you that Australia has kept pace. Okay? In some years we've done a bit better, some years we haven't done quite so well, but we're still solidly in the pack. So we're keeping pace with other advanced economies, but it also tells you that the emerging economies um, have the advantage of catch up and they've done really well. So, so China and Brazil, who are on the chart, uh, their relative productivity has been much faster than ours for a prolonged period of time now. Uh, and so the race isn't going to get easier, it's going to get harder. And then the last part of this um, <clears throat> is when you look back at how we've done over the last 20 years, uh, Australia's more than doubled the value of its output. So that's the long-term story. Australian that the real value, sorry, the nominal value uh, of output has more than doubled. It's increased 110% uh, over 20 years. Um, but volume, the volume story, uh, is, is only about a third of the total increase. And prices, so his favourable prices over a, a sustained period of time, uh, have done two thirds of the story. So I'm a bit of a uh, Clint Eastwood fan, I'm sorry if that offends, uh, but I still remember the Dirty Harry movie with Are You Feeling Lucky? Okay? Australia can't control global prices. So if we want to shape our own destiny, we need to think about either how we increase uh, volumes or how we shift from one value segment to another se value segment. Um, so, so we may get lucky. <clears throat> 
There's a variety of views here. There's an interesting and legitimate debate, but ag economists are sort of uh, trained at their professor's knee to be skeptical about the prospects of future price growth. Okay, we have at least five decades, half a century, last uh, uh, century, with a, a persistent downward trend in, in commodity prices. Okay, we have the first decade uh, of, the, of the new uh, century. Uh, where it was pretty flat and spiky. So we had food price spikes, we had a bunch of things, uh, and there's an open question about whether the trend has reversed and, and it might start to go up. There's a coherent argument there around not so much population growing, but incomes growing. That story from the first slide, Asia re-emerges, uh, that demand will grow, that uh, supply of good quality arable land is, is pretty fixed. Uh, what we don't know is the technology story. You know, how much uh, are we going to invest in R&D? How much is that going to put downward pressure on prices? And so if we, we know if we weren't investing in technology, prices would trend up. Uh, but we don't know how the balance is going to come out. So uh, uh, another watch point uh, about what's going on and, and what's, the, what's the source of success. Probably not in the magic source uh, notion. <coughs> Third big um, challenge for us uh, is climate variability and change. Uh, this is uh, fabulous work by Abez that had happened to be done before I was uh, the head honcho. Uh, we released it uh, at the last Outlook conference a, a year ago. Uh, and what it does is very clever work to disentangle the climate signal, the variability, uh, from the underlying productivity story. And it shows you in the first half of the graph a, a, a steep upward uh, increase in the red line. So that's agricultural productivity growing. Um, when you strip out the climate uh, variability, and then it goes flat. And it goes flat for quite a long time. Uh, and it indicates that we had this increase in variability. We already lived in the most variable climate. It got more variable around the time of the Millennium Drought. It was really hard work, and it took farmers, and this, this data is from cropping industry, took farmers a while to get used to that. And then there's an open question in the last little period, which refers to the little arrow down the bottom, about so the data tells us we've returned to trend growth. It's not as strong as it was before, but we're not sure whether that's a durable return to trend. And so climate variability um, is a big deal. Now, climate change and climate variability are global phenomenons. Okay, so in years in the future, if climate change gets worse, which all the projections tell us it will, uh, or is likely uh, to get worse, in future years, there will be years where uh, competing markets, other producers, have bad years. And they have years that are worse than years they've had before. Uh, and if Australia is doing okay and others are doing badly, prices will go up and that will be good for us. Okay, so climate change is not an unambiguously bad story. And in the first part, the next few decades, it will be um, characterised more by variability, uh, it, it, it seems. Um, but there's a lot going on there, and we're already in a challenging space. The other aspect to climate variability and change uh, is what uh, governments, consumers, companies, uh, other actors do around the world in response to climate. And that presents uh, opportunities and likely uh, major disruptions uh, to Australian agriculture. So the exhibit here uh, is, a, is a, um, uh, uh, a map of potential land use change in Australia under a, what people in the climate community would consider a really middle ground um, scenario. Uh, so so Sari did the work, published in 2015, looking at uh, what are the incentives for farmers and how many of them might choose to, to, to opt into carbon sinks? And so to interpret the chart, the red and orange bits uh, uh, are livestock and cropping, so red livestock, orange cropping, uh, that, that doesn't change um, <coughs> uh, in this scenario that, that, that we've done. But, but the dark and light blue and the greens are areas of carbon plantings and biodiversity plantings, and it's a stonkingly large area for a middle ground um, sort of scenario. Um, the, the good news, if this scenario came to happen, is that uh, incomes for landholders as a whole, so landholders that change and landholders that don't change, incomes for landholders ever, as a whole is a third higher in this scenario where people opt in 
to carbon plantings. It's a voluntary scheme that they've modelled. Uh, then in a scenario where government didn't enable uh, carbon plantings or that farmers chose not to. So that's quite a lot of upside. The SIRA report is at pains to point out that this would be quite disruptive for regional communities, okay, and that they haven't done the analysis of what those impacts would be. But they note that money isn't everything in this story. Uh, and there are other sources of disruption. You know, you can imagine that some consumers might think uh, that beef is a not environmentally friendly consumption product or, or, or whatever. So, so there are multiple dimensions uh, to these potential opportunities and, and, and potential disruptions. The fourth opportunity and threat is around resource scarcity. So the, <coughs> the, the China re-emerges story, um, sorry, Asia re-emerges uh, story China, Indo Indonesia in particular, but let's not forget the others, um, is a story of a world which is much, much richer. Income, global GDP is more than three times higher uh, than it is today. People have a lot more money to spend, um, but you know they're not making land anymore. Uh, water falls from the sky um, and it's variable over time, but it's fixed in any one year. Uh, it's likely in Australia, given where we live and how much water we've got, uh, that in the future, desal will be a really important source of supply uh, for cities and for, for, for industry. Um, but I'm not aware of anybody who's talking about desal on a broad scale application uh, in horticulture and so forth. So we need to use our resources as well as we can and so one illustration of that is to look at what's already happening in Australia uh, in water markets. Australia is a world leader. Uh, there is much to do yet, or, or, or we can improve on what we're doing. But we're not starting in a bad place. So this is analysis which will be released at this uh, conference, a session by where Dave Galliano is speaking tomorrow. Um, and what it shows is that we've got this very substantial variability and our existing uh, water market arrangements are doing exactly what you would hope, that in dry years, water is being available to and being used by uh, the highest value uses for dry years. So perennial crops, uh, you can see a little um, emerging teal colour in, in the last few years when we worked out how to do uh, cotton in the southern Murray-Darling Basin. So cotton is an is not a perennial crop, but involves high capital investment. So once you've made the investment, you want to use the water. So we're allocating water really well across wet and dry years. The same uh, paper reports uh, on uh, model uh, uh, water use. So you can think of this as underlying demand. Uh, water use and rainfall and all those sorts of things are quite messy. And so this is a way of extracting the signal from that noisy data, and it shows you over time there's been a pivot in, in water use and water demand uh, in the southern Murray Darling. And so the, the value of, of um, uh, water in dry years for those high value crops has increased, but overall water demand has fallen. And so we've, we've reallocated water uh, towards those high value uses. Uh, and so that's a good example, but there's lots of these uh, uh, issues in resource scarcity that we need to get, get through. And then the last topic is around consumer preferences. And there's at least two dimensions to this. You know, there's how can uh, farmers at a farm level through a, through a branding initiative or, 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 or position their product, how can they access uh, high value consumers and, and move uh, into to a, a more secure and resilient spot in the value chain. Uh, but there's also uh, what economists think of as common property resource issues. So the, the illustration here is from BP uh, Deepwater Horizon. Okay, I had the privilege of working uh, on a consultancy for BP uh, a few years before this, and they were really clear that the downside risk from any one investment going wrong would just swamp the value of that investment. All right, and ironically, uh, it happened a few years later. Um, but you can't stop doing those investments. But there, it's a common property resource. Uh, and for Australia, this is an issue for brand Australia, that we need to keep doing activities, but there might be specific activities where the downside risk is so large uh, that we need to either do them differently or consider whether we do them. Now, taking that into you know, more tangible things, there, there's a really interesting um, 
uh, Edelman Trust Barometer came out a few years ago. It's an excellent and quite provocative resource. And it mapped, it asked people what their dominant concern was. So, uh, so the survey question here is the sort of survey question which leads people to think about a uh, role of government and common things. So it's not asking you about, um, you know, non-state actors' terrorism risks. And it's not really asking about cost of living uh, pressures. You wouldn't expect those to come out. But what you get <coughs> what it reported, I show the countries by the map, is their dominant concern. Um, and uh, uh, health um, uh, uh, was right up there, but environmental protection was also there. And then the, the donut chart on the side uh, simply takes the, the GDP data from that first China slide. You know, how, what's the income, uh, gross income of, of different countries, or what's their GDP, and weights up the map. And so in today's preferences, two thirds of the world is really worried about health and environment issues. It's right up there. The, the future is already with us. Um, but when we think about that, my reaction uh, is that it would be a high risk strategy uh, to imagine that emerging high income consumers of the future, uh, so a high income a Chinese person or a high in income Indonesian person, they're not going to be just a, a sort of knock-off copy of a high-income European today or a high-income North American today. They're going to have different concerns and those concerns and, and issues are going to play out in different ways. So, for ex example, I've been uh, watching the GM debate with, with interest. There's, there are uh, interesting, I find them persuasive, lines of arguments about a GM being good for the environment in several ways, uh, that involves less pesticides, often involves less extractive water use, um, <clears throat> can improve food security. Uh, Sire has already done work uh, with GM crops that have health benefits to consumers for, from Amiga oils, for example. So, you know, take the GM as an example. Uh, how do high income consumers in Asia in the future feel about GM? Uh, are they like the Europeans or not? So that's a, an area where I think it's useful for us to to lean in and participate and engage in those debates uh, rather than leave it to others to shape the agenda. That's it for me today. We've left a good chunk of time for Q&A, so, so start sharpening your questions. Thanks very much.